we have a little time at the end. Maybe we can we can do a random cool tool thing. I got a Absolutely. lot to cover. Absolutely. Yes, we we allow for a highlight time if there's time okay. exactly. Welcome everybody to today's session of Classroom 2.0 Live. Um, we're going to be talking today about digital storytelling. We're so glad that you joined us today. I'm Kim Case, and I'm pleased to co-host today with Peggy George. Uh, normally, Lorna Constantini is with us today, but she is off at a conference today presenting. And um, we're going to be talking today with Rushton Hurley in a little bit, and he's going to be our special guest. Each week at the same time, we gather to discuss technology tools and um, issues in education. Our broadcast consists of a one-hour session that is recorded. The link to the full video, audio recording, and chat log is posted to our Classroom 2.0 live site at live.classroom2.0.com. The topic each week is posted on our Classroom 2.0 live site so that you can be prepared each week with links, ideas, and tools that you'd like to share. We also bring up a movie question each week that is pre-announced so that you can bring possible answers and solutions and an open mic time at the end of the session to share new discoveries or highlights from the previous week. At the end of the show, we hope that you'll share your highlight with us, so be thinking of something should we have some time to share. Before we begin, I'd like to review some of the highlights and the features that we will be using in today's Illuminate session in case you're new to Illuminate. The first thing is uh, we will be asking some poll questions. To cast your vote, you'll be using the check mark and the red X at the top of the window in the menu. You won't click or use anything on the slides to mark your answer on the whiteboard at that time. Below the participant window is a hand with a green arrow on it. And if you'd like to ask a question or share something, please raise your hand by clicking on it, and then at that time, you would be given the ability to use your microphone to speak. Next to the hand are two emoticons, the applause symbol, and a thumbs down symbol. In the far right is a blue door. If you need to step away from your computer, please click on that blue door, and then we would know that you're not available at that time. Below those symbols is the chat window. If you'd like to send a, men a message to the room, you would type your message and then click the send button. To send your message to this room, make sure the word this room is visible in that window. If you wanted to send a message to a specific person or to all of the moderators, you would use the drop down arrow to make your selection. Moderators are able to see all of the private messages that are sent throughout the session. So keep that in mind when sending messages, but they do not show up in the Illuminate recordings. In the bottom right is the button that you would use to speak. You would click your button to activate the microphone privileges, and then be sure to click the microphone button when you're finished speaking to deactivate your microphone. If you are dissatisfied with the way the layout looks on your screen, you would click on the view option in the menu at the very top. The layouts are locked by default, so you would need to click on that option to unlock the layout. Then you can select the desired layout as shown on the right, or drag out the individual windows and resize them to fit your screen to your preferences. In a moment, we'll be using the whiteboard tools. We, today, the tool that we'll be using today is called the laser pointer, and it looks like the blue wand with the red starburst at the end. So if everybody would please click on the laser pointer now, and then click on the location on the world map, and you may need to then click on the little starburst and drag it over to the right to indicate where you're located in the world. It kind of defaults and goes to the left a teeny bit, so you may need to drag it over some to indicate your location in the world. 
for some reason it doesn't quite go in the exact location that we would like it to go. And so great to see people from South America, over in Europe, the UK, all across the United States, up in Canada. And it is so great that you have taken time to join us this morning for Digital Storytelling with Rushton Hurley. So thank you very much. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to our poll question. And the way you're going to answer the poll question is you would click on the green X in the top menu in your row at the very top menu. And you would click the green check for yes and the red X for no. And you would answer the question, have you ever created a digital story? If you have, please click the green check for yes and the red X for no, if you have ever done so. If you have ever created a digital story, please click the green check, the red or the red X for no, and then I'll get the results and I'll post those results right now. And it looks like of this group that's present, 27% have not created a digital story before, and about 49% of the group has. That's about half. So Rustin has his uh, work cut out to convince that 27% of the group to do so. <laughs> so that's great. Okay, the next question is going to involve and more participation. On the next slide, we would like you to share your favorite digital storytelling tool. You're going to either type it on the whiteboard or type it in the chat. Okay. Okay, so please click on the whiteboard text tool. What your favorite digital storytelling tool is. And so it's going to be, you know, the, the text boxes may overlap, and that's okay. You may need to then drag your text box out or move it over. So we'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and type your favorite digital storytelling tool on the whiteboard or in the chat. I see a lot of voice threads. I see scrap blogs. I see photo story, Animoto, iMovie, Movie Maker, Garage Band, Vimeo. Fantastic to see so many favorite tools. And there are so many, we could go on and on and spend hours on this one topic. But it looks like if I had to take a count, it looks like VoiceThread would win. A lot of people have chosen VoiceThread as their favorite tool for using and sharing digital stories. So now I'm going to pass it over to uh, Peggy to introduce Rushton before we head over to the newbie question. So Peggy, take it away. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to have you join us. And we're really looking forward to focusing our conversation on digital storytelling today. And we're so excited to have Rushton Hurley as our special guest to guide us through our learning. I first learned about all of the great things Rushton was doing with technology in schools when he was a guest on Women of the Web 2 last year sometime. Well, I instantly became a huge fan and wanted to follow and learn from him every chance I got. My most recent experiences were via some Illuminate sessions from the Q conference in California last month. And I got to uh, 
participate in his workshops on podcasting and getting teachers to adopt technology. And they were just loaded with excellent tips and advice. And I left there thinking, wow, there's nothing he doesn't know about helping teachers to become comfortable using technology for instruction. So I knew we had to pick one of those topics and invite him to come and join us on Classroom 2.0 Live. He just has so many resources, tips, and strategies on his site and in his head related to digital storytelling and digital photos, and we're really looking forward to hearing about those. If you haven't had the opportunity to meet Rushton, he's a teacher and a speaker who is the executive director of the educational nonprofit organization and website called Next Vista for Learning. And that's at nextvista.org. And you'll find that in our share tabs today so you can check it out later. I know you'll be excited to learn about Next Vista and the amazing video resources that are available on his site. Rushton has taught at both the high school and college level. He's been a school principal. He's worked with both charter and traditional schools. And he's even organized and run an online school. In his workshops, he specializes in getting teachers who are less familiar with technology to try free, simple tools for making teaching and learning more engaging for students. And he always does it with humor and passion. So be sure to check out the links for his sites after the show. And today, he's going to start off by answering our newbie question, just to bring everyone up to speed on exactly what is digital storytelling and how can I use it in my classroom. And then we'll continue on with the topic by sharing tips, tools, and strategies. So thank you so much for joining us, Rustin. And I'll turn the mic over to you and let you take us on our learning adventure. Hey, thanks a lot, Peggy. Thanks a lot, Kim. Um, before I, I get going, an apology to the entire group. Um, I'm kind of new to Illuminate. Seems like a wonderful tool, but uh, hopefully I won't make uh, major noob mistakes uh, along the way. Uh, also, uh, several of you have been very you know, kind of nice and giving me personal hellos, and I've kind of been fumbling with equipment, and I apologize for not kind of properly responding to those. Also, a couple of quick shout outs. Um, I believe the Shambles Guru, that's Chris Smith uh, from from Southeast Asia. Is that right? And so just pop a quick yes into the, uh, the chat. But, wow, it's just so cool to have you have you with us. That's awesome. If you've never been to his site, he has a bazillion links. Uh, I mean, I, I've never seen anything, anything close to, to what he's assembled. Uh, I also see B.J. Berkowitz. Um, Tapped in, you know, wonderful, wonderful tools there, and getting a chance to share stuff. Share stuff. Okay. Um, the, now the question about digital storytelling, you know, what is it? How can I use it? You know, at one level, that's really what we're going to talk about the the entire hour. Uh, but but I would say that generally, just broadly, the digital uh, storytelling is about using technology to convey a message. And that may seem hopelessly broad, but, but I, think it, <laughs> I think it's accurate. Um, specifically, there, there's all sorts of uses of the term, right? I mean, you, you see people say, well, you know, podcasts and enhanced podcasts, which means a podcast with a visual, which sounds like a video to me, but there you go. Um, you know, there, there's all kinds of ways the, the term gets uh, used. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a quote on, a, on the University of Houston site that I thought was uh, – uh, was, was far more artistic than I could have hoped for. Uh, a, a, a British uh, professor named Daniel Meadows uh, describes digital stories as multimedia sonnets from the people in which photographs discover the talkies and the stories told a symbol in the ether as pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, a gaggle of invisible histories which, when viewed together, tell the bigger story of our time, the story that defines who we are. That's pretty cool stuff. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the 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 sense of what storytelling can be digitally is something that I think is is really really broad, and, and I think that's exciting. Uh, and I think it's exciting for a couple of reasons. One one of the things that I want to do uh, is give you a little background, but I'm I'm, I'm also wary of <laughs> introducing myself in the next 20 minutes, which I think earned me about you know three minutes of fame on Women of the Web, um, but. Uh, how many of you have specifically used video as a way of having kids do projects? So just 
do, do the little uh, the green check or the red X on that one. You know, have you polling? It's polling time. Um, so so we have hand raise, we've got green checks and red X's and okay. I'm I'm thinking that let's let's get to the hands in just a second. But I'm thinking the people who've got the green checks know how powerful uh, video can be for kids. Uh, and you folks with the red X's, this is this is hopefully going to be a wonderful way to get you to see some real possibilities for adding, a, you know, a really exciting element to your teaching. Um, Kim, Peggy, why don't we why don't we go to some hands? Can can you make that happen? Sure. If you would like to uh, speak, click your hand, raise your hand button, and we'll give you the microphone. If you have used video before. There we go. Okay. Where's that person? There they are, David. Okay, David, go ahead. You have the microphone. Thanks. I'll make it brief. I've uh, managed to use video, uh, you could call it video blogs if you, or video podcasts if you'd like, for everything from the environmental science course to a uh, chemistry course, replacing what might otherwise be a uh, Students standing in front of the classroom with a, a slideshow presentation. You know, sometimes yes. do a slide cast, or sometimes it's a full-on uh, video that many of them have uploaded to YouTube. Fair oh, nice. good idea! Yeah, sharing it with YouTube. Thanks, David. Good deal. Yeah, and and uh, and I, I want to highlight, or actually piggyback on something that he uh, he said because I think it's a really important piece of this. Uh, I'm a language teacher. Uh, I teach uh, Japanese language uh, at a high school part time. I do that part time so that I can I can feed my nonprofit habit in my other waking minutes. Um, but but one of the things that I saw when I started using video with my language students is that the quality of their work just just went through the roof. I mean, just so much better. And it only it only kind of occurred to me at that point. That I had been asking them when, when they were presenting in front of the room, you know, doing skits or, or whatever, that I had been asking them to do two things. One is to show their command of content via their presentation, and the second is just to stand in front of uh, uh, their their friends, right, uh, and their peers, and and the people that they were hoping to date, <laughs> and things like that. And and you know, that scares the living daylights out of a lot of them. And so, you know, my ability to to properly uh, evaluate their command of the material was, was really being hampered by the fact that I was asking them to do this other thing as well. I'm not saying that presenting in front of a group is not a bad skill to learn, but but it, it it's I think important to have that be something that doesn't necessarily get in the way of what they show they can do. Uh, let's see. Let's let's go to the hands. Okay. Who else has? Okay. Yeah. No, no. You want to go ahead and take the mic? This is Paula. Go ahead, Paula. Go ahead, Paula. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I use uh, I'm listed on my eboard. Paula, you're coming in and out there a bit. I'm so sorry. Did I check oh, it didn't make you a bad person. That, that's not the case. <laughs> Thought everything was working. Actually, Paula, let, let's do this because we're, we're getting you beautifully for about two out of every seven and eight, or eight seconds. If, if you would put that into the uh, the chat window and uh, and let's watch yes. for it, and 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 that that would be great. And uh, Peggy Kim, maybe Sabine, uh, could, could sure talk to her. Sabine, his or you her wanna, absolutely. Sabine, you want to go ahead and take the mic? Yeah. I use the video also as a differentiation tool, you know, so I give the kids the option to uh, make their product in a video skit or present their uh, music when they do a, a song about something in, and tape it to show it. But I also have noticed that you have to be very careful if kids feel comfortable with uh, the video being shown because one time I got an email from an upset mama, uh, mother because her son didn't say anything but at home he said and shared with his mother that he was afraid that his video would be shown to the classroom. 
So it's a very sensitive uh, tool, and you have to be very sure that the kids feel comfortable with it. So I think that's a that's a great point. Uh, matter of fact, uh, one of the things that I've got on on my list of things to talk about, and it probably would make more sense for me to to leap a little farther into that, um, is to go over the kind of rules that that you might you might want to use as a part of projects uh, with your students, uh, because because there are some simple things that that on the front end can make this a, a much better uh, experience for them and for you. Uh, I see Paul is talking about the flip camera as well. We we should take some time to talk about the kinds of tools that are available. Uh, flip cameras are, are wonderful tools for for this kind of thing. Okay, let's see. Uh, let me let me jump into some some more background stuff. Uh, one one thing about the nature of digital storytelling is that because it, it is a very broad term, there are a lot of different ways people come at it, right? And so, uh, you know, how how you you fashion projects uh, can lead to very very wide uh, ranges of, of content from 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 students. Uh, and and if you look at something like uh, digital storytelling and my site uh, nextvista.org, you know, I think the the natural question is, okay, well, what what is it what is it unique that I bring perhaps to uh, to to this world? And uh, what, what my site is, what Next Vista is, is an online library of videos made by and for teachers and students everywhere. It's free to use, it's free to contribute to, but it's screened content. Uh, it's not that anyone can upload anything. Uh, there are other sites where that's, that's the way it works, and that's fine. Um, but uh, it's very much that we want to, to keep quality high uh, and, and also have the videos be be focused on a student audience. That's that's a big deal for us. Uh, it might help to uh, to describe a couple of differences, for example, with uh, with other um, other sites that, that do this kind of thing. So, for example, TeacherTube is something that uh, that is available to us all. It's it's a it's a it's a good it's a good tool, but anyone can upload anything. Um, some some of the material there is good for students. Some of it's good for teachers. Some of it is of higher quality. Some of it's not. Uh, and then there is also uh, there's also kind of an onslaught of ads that you face. And and that it's a commercial site means that that's that they're they're working somewhat differently uh, to accomplish things than I think ours is. Uh, you can find very high quality content for free at at the Edutopia site. Uh, but but that it's such high quality. Uh, means that it's it's focused for very specific purposes and perhaps not quite as as open to collaboration as something more like a teacher tube or a YouTube or a, or a next system. Uh, so I think you know they're both strong tools, but they're different. And understanding that difference is a good thing. Uh, we have a set of rules for our site. Um, those rules are, and let me kind of uh, toss these in real quick. And if anybody is is uh, you know up for typing as I speak, uh, I, I would be honored. Uh, the first rule is that a video should be five minutes or less. Uh, that has to do with uh, uh, <laughs> partly just due to file size and, and download time and that kind of thing. Partly it has something to do with, well, attention span and, and no, no explanation needed there. A second is that uh, videos should have no copyrighted content. Now we. Uh, we, we, I think we take that more seriously than most. I mean, there, there's an awful lot of copyrighted material that shows up in a lot, uh, a lot of the things that are out there. It, it's a very complex issue, and we, we try hard to, to stay to it. Although, uh, although there are some, some gray areas that, that you know we've, you know we've kind of uh, lines we've trod over from time to time. Um, but it is something that I think is, is important. Uh, Chris mentions uh, Creative Commons. No, no, anything that's copyright friendly. As a matter of fact, I should have made that distinction. Uh, what we want is is to have copyright friendly content. I think uh, Creative Commons is 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 exactly the kind of uh, licensing system that that makes things you know exciting and possible for teachers and students. And uh, one site that I'll I'll put I'll, I'll recommend real quick is search.creativecommons.org. Search dot creative commons one word dot org. There's a there's really there's a wonderful system there for finding copyright friendly content content for multimedia. Thanks, Deb. Uh, for multimedia and for all kinds of different projects you might do. And you just you just teach people to make citations and you're you're good to go. 
Uh, third rule is that nothing should be inappropriate for a young audience. So, you know, we have high schoolers and, and uh, people in their first and second year of college uh, putting stuff up. We also have third graders looking at material. So, so we want uh, uh, we want good material. Uh, you know, that won't freak any of the young kiddos out. Or I will I will definitely speak to to, to copyright friendly music uh, in just a second. Uh, the the fourth is that uh, videos should be factually accurate and properly cited. Right? And so so those those are our rules. Uh, and and having uh, having you know matter of fact I just saw a. Uh, uh, a mention for free play and Ms. Nerf, uh, I, I'm going to have to differ with you. Freeplaymusic.com looks like a fantastic site to use. It's not. Um, if you get into their, uh, their, their fine print, you find that they won't, they, they prohibit teachers from using it in the classroom without paying, which I think is actually going beyond uh, fair use laws in the United States. That's pretty uncool. I, I communicated with them about it and they were uh, they were not helpful. Um, now there are two wonderful sites uh, that I use a lot. One called PodSafeAudio.com, and the other called Jamendo.com. Uh, Ms. Nerf, I understand completely. Matter of fact, I was using <laughs> free play music until one of my students said, "Hey, Mr. Hurley, hey, did you read that free per the free uh, fine print on that?" <laughs> no. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah. So it, it's uh, I just I just can't recommend free play music. They've got a lot of good stuff, but you know you got to pay for it. Um, so PositiveAudio.com and Jamendo.com, Jamendo, J-A-M-E-N-D-O.com. Uh, both are very good sites. You know, the, the thinking there is, hey, we've made music. We want people to know about it and to talk about it and to share it with, e with other people so that, you know, they'll come and, and listen to more of our music and we don't charge for it, but just make sure you cite it. And, and that's, that's a totally appropriate and cool way to use the web for that kind of thing. Uh, there's, a, there's also a site that I like to recommend called partnersinrhyme.com. Partnersinrhyme.com uh, has quite a, quite a bunch of stuff that they sell, but they also have free sound effects. And so <laughs> you can get, you know, like barking dogs and applause and people burping or whatever you need, right? Uh, so so that, that kind of thing is, is there as well. You know, if you go to their front page, you can find a... Uh, uh, a link on it to free sound effects and, and do that. That's that's good stuff. Okay, so so that kind of runs through the rules. Uh, you know, it tells a little bit about uh, my site, nexus.org, uh, and and what I want to also speak to for a few minutes. Uh, some of you guys are getting scared that I won't stop speaking. I promise it will happen. Um, but speak to it for a few minutes is is the personal side of digital storytelling. Because I think this is actually the, the really important one, right? Uh, first of all, when when digital stories are used to to address students' academic needs, I think some pretty powerful things happen. First of all, let, let's go back to the uh, you know what we were talking about uh, you know with regard to um, actually I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> so I can't try to watch the chat window at the same time. Um, but, but, well, let's do this. All right, let's go back to what we were talking about regarding presentations at, at the front of the room. Um, one, of the, one of the great things about a digital story that, that would be uh, shown to the rest of the class uh, is that, that the student has the time to really craft it right, to really make sure that it's right. And and then and putting it together and not worrying about I'm afraid I'm going to mess up you know I mean to have it right means that it's going to come across well I mean kids kids celebrate each other you know they 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 love they love watching these videos and I think as Sabine mentioned before not all of them want their stuff to be shown but if you're real upfront about we're all going to watch these you know the quality has to be high <laughs> you know that that can make a difference. You, having an opt out for people to say no, you know, this this is going to scar me emotionally. Okay, fine. Um, but uh, nevertheless, you know, being able to to see what each other is doing when when what they've done is something they've had a chance to make it make it right makes a big difference. And and that happens for for a very simple reason, I think. Uh, an unfortunate number of our students. Uh, never get to hear the things that sometimes they hear when videos get shown. You know, you, you know, kids make a video, they put a couple of cool sound effects in it, people turn to look at them and they say, 
hey, that was really cool. Hey, that was great. That's huge. It's a really, really big thing, right? Because you know, way too many of these kids go home, and, and no one at home ever says to them, hey, that was cool. Hey, that was great. And, and they need that. Uh, too many of our kids don't get that from teachers, honestly. And so having, having a, a way for them to really put that together is something that I think is, is, is very powerful. Uh, so, so that's, you know, that's something that I think has, has long-term impact. I, I met a, a student of mine a couple of years ago who graduated back in the day, uh, and, he's, and one of the things he said was, hey, Mr. Hurley, so, you know, we're both adults now. <laughs> I, I was then. Um, and he said, hey, Mr. Hurley, the videos were my favorite part of high school. And, and I, you know, I was kind of bowled over. I was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm really glad that that was such a, a great piece of it for you. Uh, because, you know, I, I like them. I know the students like them. But, but sometimes, you know, we, we do stuff and we don't understand how, how very powerful it can be uh, for, uh, uh, for, for the kids. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let me, let me make one more, more thought on this. <laughs> He just keeps talking. Um, and that's that, that being able to use videos means that you can, you can go to kids, especially the kids who aren't doing as well in your class, and say, okay, we're going to be doing projects where you're going to explain something you've learned. Oh, but I'm not doing well. Well, you've learned something, right? You know, can you do this? Well, yeah, I can do that. Having them make videos that teach means that you're giving them that sense of academic confidence that they need to succeed. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Sue. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think one of the things that happens with something like crafting a video in, in any editor, Movie Maker, iMovie, uh, you know, Final Cut Pro, it doesn't matter, is that, that working with, with video clarifies the tie between effort and success. If, if anything is going make, you know, to make us confident that our kids are going to be okay down the line, it's that they understand that. They're putting in effort reaps success, and I think that's that's important. Okay, so uh, let me see. There, there's some other things that I, I want to talk about over the course of the uh, 27 minutes I haven't already monopolized, um, and that includes, for example, some projects that you, you might want to do with your kids, um, and, and I would be very happy to do that. So uh, Kim or Peggy, if you want to uh, to either open up to questions or if there are some specific questions that I missed because I stopped trying to multitask, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to <laughs> jump on that. <laughs> you keep going, and when I see some, I'll write them down, and when it's about 10 more minutes, then we'll take questions from the participants. Okay. Um, by the way, Peggy, I, I see that Deb you know, shot a question on there. By the way, Deb, thanks again for typing up the rules before. Uh, am I big on storyboarding? Um, I, I often, but well, yes, uh, and I often uh, tell tell the people who I am teaching to do video editing. I tell them that the hardest part of making a video has nothing to do with the technology. It's the planning. You know, if you're going to have a video, it's not because you picked up a, a camera and decided to see what would happen next. Uh, it's because you, you you came up with a really clever way of pulling things together. And, and a, a storyboard, you know, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different ways to look at storyboarding, but I think it comes down to, uh, to, to three major components. First is, what are people going to see? You know, when, in, in that part of your video, in that scene, what are people going to see? Uh, the second is, what are they going to hear or read? And, and let me uh, toss in a, um, a, a plug for, for having um, captions on your videos, to, to have, you know, like a little thing at the bottom that says what you're saying. That, that, that's a nice move there. Uh, and then finally, uh, there should be some notes about what's happening. So it could, it could be a note about we're going to do an unusual camera angle here. We're going we're gonna to do this kind of uh, transition afterwards. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that this kind of thing is in the background. Uh, do it at this time of day so the light's right, whatever. So, so you've got, you know, kind of storyboarding really just needs to come down to those three things. For each scene, what is it people will see? What is it they will hear and or read? And what are the extra little things that, that you might work into how it works, whether it's special effects or transitioning or any of that? Hope that's, hope that's useful. Mm -hmm. 
Bob. Stop not. <laughs> cool group. Uh -huh. um, Peggy, Kim, could, could one of you uh, pass the mic over to Bob now? Absolutely. Bob, you want to go ahead and ask your question? He can. Oh, okay. No go problem. ahead, Bob. Go ahead, go ahead and type it up, and, and that's cool. Uh, while you're typing it, um, you, you know, I think YouTube is making some, some good moves uh, in terms of uh, making some education things possible. It doesn't change the fact that they allow almost anybody to, to upload anything and that until somebody catches it or objects to it, you know, it goes down. That's problematic. I mean, ideally we'd be teaching our, our kids how to, how to deal with that stuff, you know, rather than just filtering it. But nevertheless, a lot of it's filtered. And, and that's uh, that's an issue. Maybe Evelyn there. Evelyn, you want to go ahead and ask your question? And afterwards, I'll I'll do your question, Bob. There's clearly some bad microphone karma in the ether today, and uh, and I think we should all remind <laughs> ourselves that that doesn't make us bad people or, you know, it's not going to keep us out of heaven. That's important. Um, now, Bob's question was, what do okay. you use as a rubric for grading, grading projects? And, you know, I mean, it, it, boy, it just depends on the project. Um, I think it's good, uh, you know, there, there's, in terms of assessment, um, I think it, <laughs> the first piece of advice I'd give you is uh, don't, don't tell them that it's due in a week, right? You know, give, give them like four to six weeks. You know, give, give them loads and loads and loads of, of time. And uh, I also recommend having the grade split up into two things. First of all, the plan for the video and then the video, uh, which kind of forces the, the, the plan to actually happen, uh, with, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> um, the, uh, some other things I do uh, is I would say, you know, um, people often will say, "Hey, you know, I'd love to do, I'd love to do videos, um, but, you know, some of my kids don't have computers, uh, or not all my kids have access to this, that, the other." Uh, I, I understand uh, you, you don't you don't want to cut anybody off, but but let me let me say this: I have been doing video projects in one form or another for about eight nine years, and and I I try to always. Uh, tell the students, you know, if you would prefer an alternative, if you would prefer to make a poster, uh, that's fine. And, and you know, they never choose the poster. They never do. <laughs> and, and why is that? Um, part of it is because posters are not cool and videos are cool. And, and that's, uh, I mean, that's real. That's a very real thing. Uh, kids want to do what's cool. They, they want that feedback we talked about, you know, a little bit before. Another good rule is that they don't have to work alone. Um, you know, you may work with uh, with up to one or two other students on this project, and and you you can make adjustments to it if you wish. You can say, okay, and, and instead of the video being 45 seconds, you know, it's going to be 45 seconds per person. That's fine. You know, what, whatever kind of meets your needs uh, for for what you're teaching. Um, They'll find a way to do this. Uh, they'll find a way to make it happen, even if it's you know finding the one classroom on campus where they can borrow a computer because they don't have something at home. Um, a good thing to remember, too, is that even though, you know, with, especially with the flip cameras and, and similar equipment, you know, the ability to do, to do footage is, is much easier than, than it was. Despite that, you can make really good videos out of pictures, right? And uh, you, you, you should, you should, even if you're teaching um, video production, you know, one of the first things I would, I would have, you know, I have done when I teach it is get people to just try doing uh, videos that are collections of stills. Uh, you know, the stuff at animoto.com that, you know, is there. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's a good, uh, it's, a, it's a good mention, Maggie, and I know a lot of people were talking about that before. Um, the, the Neil Stevenson, the author, cool, um, uh, having historical documentaries. I mean, that, that, that's, you know, exactly what you need to do, right, you know, to, to get the pictures together and to start pulling that uh, together. One, one piece of, of doing of doing photos and recording your voice over them, by the way, that sometimes people don't think about, is that if you do it that way, it becomes very easy to create uh, multiple versions of the video in various languages, right? So, so being able to, uh, uh, Sabine, I'll come back to your vocabulary question, if that's a good one. Um, it, it's good to be able to have, uh, have students think in terms of, okay, I'm going to create this video in English, and I'm also going to do a, uh, 
uh, you know, a Spanish version of it or a Vietnamese version of it or anything like that. Uh, that's that's an awfully good move. Uh, so so real quick on vocabulary teaching, uh, I think I think that there the ability to to tell a story in an almost linear fashion in a video is not bad for getting people to to connect to vocabulary visually. There are other ways that I, I would recommend. Uh, CoolIris.com, C-O-O-L-I-R-I-S.com, is a way of creating a photo wall. Uh, and, and if you select a, a group of pictures that, uh, that represent the vocab you want to teach, I've done this as, as a language teacher. Boy, it works well. Great stuff. And big announcement here, three, day, <laughs> yay, uh, three days ago, um, photo, uh, Cool Iris came out with uh, a, an upgrade that allows you to, to do the photo wall with photos that are, that are on your drive. So you can have a, a folder on your desktop with, uh, you know, 10 or 100 pictures on it and, and call up the Cool Iris photo wall, and, and that's, that is just wildly cool. Why, why is it wildly cool? It's wildly cool because it is visually compelling. It's visually, visually arresting, right? You know, kids can be talking to each other in class. You can throw up the photo wall and start, you know, pulling, pulling them up, you know, and, and kids stop and, and look. It's really, really interesting, and that – that is a key piece of our being successful as teachers is finding ways to capture their attention. I talk about that a lot in uh, in, in my workshops. You know, how do we how do we get their attention so that they stop and they go, wait, wow, that wow, that really does apply to me. <laughs> how often have we thought? So so anyway, so you know those those kinds of uh, you know those kinds of components or, or attributes to uh, to to visual images of any sort uh, are you know are are a, are a big chunk of why. Digital storytelling is important for kids. Cool. Let's see. Uh, you know, another thing that I, I would hate myself if I got to the end of the thing and didn't talk about. You know, another thing you don't have to do uh, is you don't have to be on camera. Um, and matter of fact, when students are making videos, there's a lot of good reasons not to have them on camera. Uh, safety, you know, because there's a really big difference between making a video for your classroom and making a video that you're going to stick anywhere online that's accessible to anybody. Uh, and and if, if the kids aren't actually you know, in view, that simplifies a lot of things. If they don't say their names, that's even better. Matter of fact, they can suddenly have new names, right? Like uh, I remember you know, in college uh, going to a restaurant and having someone say, you know, my name is Bjorn, you know, I'd like a table for four. And so they're trying to spell Bjorn. And, and uh, ha ha, that's funny. And then, you know, I think, okay, wait, you know, it makes a lot of sense for people to pick a funny name and to use that as a part of their video. Can you share some of your favorite free photo sites? That was wildly alliterative. Uh, that allow you to create a Yes, happily do so. Um, the search.creativecommons.org site is, is a really good place to start. Uh, it points you to Flickr, which is my favorite. Uh, fl Flickr, F L I C K R, uh, dot com has over 2 billion, with a B, that's with a B is in big number, um, photos in it, loads and loads of which are identified uh, as Creative Commons licensed. Uh, so, you know, there, there's some simple things you can do to make sure that you're citing this stuff right. One of the things I recommend is, so you, you, go, to a, you go to a Flickr page with a, with, with a nice picture on it, and you, you copy the title of the picture, and then you click on All Sizes, above the picture, because uh, that's often there, and not always, but almost always. Uh, and then you can, you can download, you know, you can do the save image as. Uh, you can paste the title, because often, you know, it'll say, you know, A6342 blah, 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 blah JPEG, that's, that's the name. So, so you paste the title, and then add by, and then just at the top of the, the window, just kind of type in the name of the person who, who uploaded the picture. Uh, hopefully it's their work. Uh, and then, you know, from a Flickr. And, and so then you've got all of your citation information in the file name. Because it, it, it's a total pain to go back and try to find stuff later, right? So, so that's, that's one site. Another good site, which has some very high quality Congrats. stuff, but not nearly as many, is morguefile.com. M-O-R-G-U-E-F-I-L-E.com. There you go. I'll take a breath. You, you, uh, you talk. I was just going to say, why don't we go to the uh, Flickr site? Because uh -huh. the Creative Commons part and the licensing can be kind of confusing for beginners. And okay. I pulled up a web tour. And if you could just talk to that for just a little bit. I'll describe it quickly. 
Um, the uh, the one one thing I, I should say is you know I mean copyright is really really complex um, and 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 that's just in the U.S. right uh, you know I mean there there are copyright issues everywhere um, but but you see you see the different little little things that appear there so you see the buy an attribution line that license that means that you can use it but just make sure you tell who did it right. The no derivatives license, the, the equal sign, that, that means you can't really change it. Don't pull it into paint and add some stuff, right? The non-commercial. Uh, the non-commercial is a really common license there, you know, which essentially means you, know, you can use this, but don't use it in something you're selling. And I'm simplifying this probably to a point where it's not <laughs> accurate, no, <laughs> but, but hopefully that's not. That's perfect. Um, OK. And then the, the share alike. Um, Share alike is one that you know. Let me let me scroll up and see if I can just read it to you. We allow others to distribute derivative works only under a license identical. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So so you know whatever it is you create, you have to have exactly the same license. So if it's uh, if it's like that last one down here, the buy and the uh, see at the very bottom attribution share alike license. Uh, so it has to be the same thing. Great to have okay. the information right in front of you. There's a hand raised as well from the Zolipino. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Zolfi. You have the microphone. It's the curse of the microphone. Um, how about music? Uh, where can I get free music? Okay. Um, I, I'd, I'd take you back to the uh, PodSafeAudio.com and Jamendo.com, and if you'll and if you'll roll the uh, the chat window up, you'll find those. Those those are very very good sites. And Chris is asking, um, where would you suggest a beginner began with digital storytelling? Question. Um, the and, and is when we say the beginner, do, do we mean anyone? Do we mean a teacher? What we got there? Chris, are you referring to a teacher? Teacher. Okay. Um, and and first of all, by the way. Um, uh, Chris Smith, Shambles Guru, put up a, a, a list of websites on photos and clip art uh, for for legal to use that that is kind of crawling up the chat window right now. That that's a great place to go. Um, so where to begin? What, one person mentions VoiceThread. VoiceThread is really really cool, but um, you know I, I can't remember offhand whether and, and tell me you Voice VoiceThread jockeys out there. Um, can you create a voice thread and then download it as a as a as a WMV or an MOV or a, or a something or other V? I mean, or, or do you have to leave it on voice thread? I thought if you had an account, a paid account, you could download it. But if you did not, yeah, if you didn't have the paid account, then you have to leave it on their site. Okay. Um, and embedding, good point. But I could be wrong. Um, and Roxanne. Uh, the uh, I, I'm I'm always a little wary of, of the sites where you know the money has to change hands in order for you to be able to get the piece to make further edits to it if you want, right? Um, they're they're good tools, you know, Animoto, VoiceThread, those are good tools for sure. Um, just understand those limitations, right? I would say that I, well, the, the screaming thing that I would scream. Hence the adjective uh, would be that you should you should use free tools. Find free tools if you're on a Mac. You know, use iMovie. If you or you know, the, you can actually make videos in GarageBand and stuff like that. It's very cool. If you're on a PC, use Photo Story 3. Use Windows Movie Maker. There are a heap of tutorials for learning to use these things. Uh, and you know, if you go to YouTube.com, which I believe is the number two search engine on on the uh, the web now. You know, if you're trying to find inform information on something, you go to YouTube. That's kind of cool. Um, at any rate, so if you type in, say, photo story tutorial or audacity tutorial, uh, you know, that's that's a way to get get a lot of help on how to use those uh, use those tools. And by the way, speaking of audacity, audacity for for both Mac and PC people, although particularly PC people, is a very powerful audio editing thing. So if you're using a free video editor. It has only one um, one extraneous audio track, uh, then then you can mix music and your voice and other things in Audacity, pop it out, and then pull it into say Movie Maker, and you're you're doing good. So Audacity is is 
Ms. Durf, I agree completely. Love that program. Great program. Atomic Learning has tutorials, good. Uh, and they have free tutorials and there's a paid system as well. And, and apparently, you know, people who pay for it are, are, are love it, so really good stuff. What else we got? Okay, um, is this Diva Herbert to share um, today with the, our participants? Um, none that I've put together, um, but uh, I'm guessing that there are several people here. And and and, and click in if, if you're if you're one of these people, or type in or or vote in or or whatever in you do. Uh, to do you use Rubistar? R U B I S T A R. Rubistar dot com maybe. Yeah, because I think you know I think you can find just just heaps and heaps and heaps of, of rubrics there. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, org and that's it's, a good um, place. Yeah, it has lots of templates to use. And good. yeah, that that would that would be really a good place to go. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Um, somebody else is there a free job. online storyboarding program. A free online storyboarding program. Um, hmm. Probably. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, if I, you know, I've created a, a story. Let me give me just a second. Let me see if I can call up a link with with a uh, with one that I created. In Momento. Uh, let's see. Be awfully cool if I could find it. Drat. Um, Small victory. All right, hold on a minute. Uh, let me let me Wham. Thanks, Boom. Jackie, for that link, Jackie. Uh, for for the many people cool. who are much faster than I am getting those in, you know, very cool. Um, but but the one that I put there is one that that is purposefully simple, right? Uh, I, I'd say clap when, whenever you feel that there's a victory that's happened. You know, we, we do it when our when our small children, of course, you know, become toilet trained, mm -hmm. but. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things. What else we got? Um, somebody said, how did, um, how do you get over the tedious process of storyboarding? <laughs> um, I'd say play Toto and Journey while you do it, but uh, that's, that's, that's just me. <laughs> um, I, I, let's see. I would, I would say that that it, it's tedious when we put too much into it. Right. It's it's not a tedious thing to um, to say, you know, just just to write down something like, okay, you know, this is going to be with this person's head on the left side of the screen. Loud. And that's very nice. It's important to capitalize loud in that situation. Good job. Good job, Chris. Um, the uh, <laughs> what was I saying? Oh yeah, tedious. So so anyway, uh, the the idea is to essentially say. Let's get this. Let's get this out, and it doesn't have to be big, right? What is it people are going to say? You know, you know, what fun thing do, do we think we'll do with the camera along the way? That's that's all good. So so it it doesn't have to be a big and involved thing. The the more you put restrictions on it, the more tedious it becomes. Understanding that the fewer restrictions, the you know the more tenuous the quality of of the planning. So there you go. That, that that's a that's a, a wonderfully political kind of answer to that question. <laughs> and somebody asked about using Comic Life for digital storytelling. What is your perception comments, of that? Comments Live. I, I actually don't know what that is. What? Oh, Comic Life. Huh? Comic, <laughs> comic Life. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know. So anyway, um, com Comic Life is is a very cool tool, um, and uh, I believe it is not free. Um, but but it's not expensive either, and it's something that kids really enjoy using. Um, you know, there there are some other ways of of making kind of interesting uh, multimedia uh, posters. You know, I, I think do, do any of you use Blogster? G L O G S T E R. I mean, I, you know, I suppose I could be actually going to trouble of typing some of this. Um, and we got a. Ooh, I love dogs. That's awesome. Uh, you can make yeah, a multimedia poster, you know, that would have like uh, you know audio and things like that. So, so that that's an interesting way to uh, to get some of those things together. But but yeah, I mean, Comic Life is a good thing for creating cool visuals that you then pop out into JPEGs and then can pull into simple video editors without a doubt. 
Willie KJ, uh, Pixton, online comic creator. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so yet another. And is that free? Two dollars per license, Kevin. Good, good thought there. Like talking portfolios. Out. Oh, you know, actually, I, you know, I, I did make a couple of. But actually, you know, in, in the spirit of making sure that there, there's, there's really good stuff, you know, kind of available. Ha! Wikipedia. Um, there's a, there, there's some good there's some good links on that page, uh, believe it or not. Uh, there are also uh, so, you know there's also some people doing a lot of serious work out there. Not to say we aren't, um, but but the Center for Digital Storytelling. Uh, you know I've got that. Yeah, let me slap. It. This is a really interesting crowd, uh, t which takes digital storytelling very very seriously. They're also expensive. If, you, if you're in one of their things, then you know it's like 500 bucks for three days or something, which uh, which I figure would get me a plane ticket to Hawaii. Right? Um, here is uh, here is the University of Houston site. Um, they've got uh, they, you know they've got a lot of cool things going on there as well. Uh, and then finally, there's the Visual Knowledge Project at CSU Monterey Bay, um, which is which is really interesting stuff. And I believe Digitales is in our um, yes our share tab link. You know, let let me do this. Let me do this last thing, considering we're running out of time, and I have spent yes, an inordinate amount of time, you know, like trying to figure my own uh, lines of thought out, story of my life, and doing it again. Uh, and that would be projects that that you might choose to do. Let me let me kind of toss some things out there. Um, you know, you you've got you've got like say six weeks left of school or whatever you've got, and you say okay. Something you've learned this year, I want you to create a 30 or 45 second or one minute piece that's creatively explained something you've learned. You know, and that's that's a great project, and it's something that might well be able to go on my site, which I'm into. Um, you can you know start with a study term, so stratified rock. Okay, create a, a really fun video on stratified rock. It can be done. Uh, tell about a career in a in a field that's connected to what you're learning, right? So so you do a project where you say, okay, you know let's let's find uh, you know let's some, find somebody who works in this field. Have them tell what what their job is, what uh, what they do day to day, what kind of education or training it took to get there, and uh, and what they love about their work. I mean that's that's a great project. Uh, a project telling about a community is a good thing. You know what what, did it, what is your community kind of cool for? Not not, not so much a uh, you know here are the the sites the tourists find as how do you see your community right? And telling about volunteers is cool as well. And I'm on Twitter. Uh, let's see, or is somebody on Twitter? I am Rushton H on Twitter, by the way. Although I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm a good Twitterer. But there you go. Finally, uh, let me let me put like one more totally self-serving uh, link in here. That's going to be nextvista.org/newsletter. Um, I think I typed that right. Uh, and and so that I'll I'll say anybody who signs up for the newsletter, or if you just sign up on that site and say I don't want the newsletter, but but send me free resources, I'll send you like a, a two-page thing of resources that I came up with a while back. Happy to send that to anybody who signs up. So feel free, go ahead. You know you can always like tell me later I don't want any part of this, and that's fine. Um, so <laughs> so that that would be welcome. And um, several of Russian links are in our share town link, so be sure to. Click on the share tabs link and make sure that you get that link before you exit the the uh, session today. And we are so thankful today that Russian has joined Thanks us today to talk about digital storytelling. Thanks. And next week on April 25th, we're going to be talking about copyright and creative commons. And hey, Russian has started the conversation today talking about digital storytelling. And we're going to continue that with what's important for teachers to know about copyright and Web 2.0, and how can Creative Commons licensing help us? We're, our you. special guest is going to be Kristen Hokanson next week. And the survey um, that we would like you to fill out, um, telling Illuminate about their services. And let me get that link for for everybody. Just one second. I thought I had the link ready, but I didn't.
And one thing to add uh, when you get the chance um, is how, how do we, how do we, is there kind of an easy way of getting the uh, the chat thing? I mean, so many people were tossing up really cool tools in this. Uh, you do a select all, or how does this work? Well, you oh, can, yeah. but um, actually, the link um, the to the chat log will be posted later today, and with that link, um, all of the links are clickable in the chat log. So, if, okay. but if you were to save the chat log today. Um, through the session, they're not clickable. But if you wait just a little bit, then all of it's compiled and processed, and then it's separated out, and then the links are clickable. That, that sounds like a good move. I just pasted pasted the whole thing into a, a, a Word document. It was 50 pages. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it, it isn't real practical because I've tried it that way, and it didn't work out for me because all of the text is like on one kind of wrapped line. And it, it wasn't successful. So anyway, I just wish that he did his, yeah, his magic, and then it's taken care of. And Steve has also created another new site called the Future of Education, and with the uh, conjunction of the Knowledge of Works Foundation, he has an interview series, and I thought. On um, April 23rd, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific, there's going to be a series on called Open Content in Education, and more details on the specifics of the session will be coming. And on April 21st, Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern and 12.30 p.m. Pacific, the 2020 forecast, Creating the Future of Learning, um, the Knowledge Works Foundation president and the CEO of Knowledge Works Foundation, Chad Wick, and futurist Andrea Saver. Those two individuals will be talking about what they predict the uh, future of learning will entail on Wednesday, April 21st. So be sure to join us then. And We'd like to extend a very special thanks to Rushton Hurley for being our special guest today, and Steve Hargadon for being uh, for founding Classroom2.0.com and the Future of Education.com. And a very special warm thank you to everybody who joined and participated today, and sharing their links and knowledge and their highlights today. And a warm thank you to Illuminate for sharing this forum for us to get together every week. Um, at this same time. And so thank you everybody for joining us and we'll see you next Saturday at this same time. And um, as we get ready to sign off next um, on the 20, Mr. what day is that? Is the Earth Cast 21st? Their edtechtalk.com the 22nd, I totally blanked out. They're having the 24 hour, the 21st and the 22nd, um, uh, the Earth Cast is on, and there's the link to the session. 24 hours of webcasting, so be sure to join them in honor of um, the webcast, the webheads, and, and Earth Day. So be sure to join them. And, and we appreciate everybody for joining us today, and thank you for coming. And somebody had mentioned if, as we get ready to sign off, Russian, if you could uh, briefly talk about, and briefly is a, 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 <laughs> the key here, about um, what the process is for digital storytelling. Get a good idea, gather media, Use a free tool, and if you're not sure how to do that, then go to YouTube or email me. Ta -da. Okay, great. Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you, everybody. Have a great Saturday. And please share your digital stories and join us next week for Creative Commons and Copyright. Okay.
we, we should have brought that in. Um, I think rules specific to to how they use the content are key there, right? Um, if if you say make a video about biology, you know, then then yeah, it kind of goes nuts. Uh, if uh, if you say okay, you know, you have to you have to use one of one of these twenty kind of terms, and you have to say at least three things about that term, or you ha you have to present three things about that term in in your digital story somewhere. I think that's uh, uh, that's kind of a good way to get things going. I I, <laughs> I forbid kids from using uh, uh, kung fu, <laughs> which you know the, the kids are kind of like oh you know, and I'll say no, there can be no death. Oh no, you know, but you know, I just I just don't want kung fu to be a part of a you know a piece about photosynthesis. Excuse me. That's a good point. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that, but that's a good point. Oh my God! And, and, and what you don't want to do, I mean, and, and this is for, for you teachers who are, are masochistic enough to still be on the line. Um, if you don't have that rule, something something about a tenth grade boy, you know, I mean, they they will create uh, an action film out of any topic, you know, any topic at all will suddenly become an action film, and, and you got to put time limit time limits on it, or or you're doomed doomed to like have to watch them, which. You know, if you sign it, you pretty much have to watch them. And, and, and watching like four different 17-minute pseudo quote action unquote movies in a row—I mean, that, that'll just—you'll just want to shoot yourself. Jeff, I hear you. Yeah, uh, just, the, you know, yeah that main cartoon kind of stuff. Sad but true. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the rules. It's the rules that that you place on it that, that make the difference there. Oh yeah, having, having videos that show how not to do it. That that's a that's a great tip, Sabine. If your video is hilarious, your rules video. The. The uh, are you talking about the lab rules video? Yes. Mm -hmm. That that was done by uh, Mark Doan in in Los Angeles. Uh, he yeah, and that that and is that is a brilliant video. video. Mm -hmm. Rubrics. <laughs> I have people trying to pin me down on the rubrics front. <laughs> Go to Rubistar. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Well, Peggy and Kim, um, that felt great. I mean, I, I felt I felt really good about the group. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, I realized.